gonna touch this guy with a 10 foot pole. Oh, don't worry. I'm not afraid to tackle this guy. Unless you were talking about the animation. Which, in that case, yeah, I really can't. I tried. There were only like 10 sins total I could find. Ah, Jerry. You and your very strong opinion about Slice of Life. I will be honest, I was looking forward to your opinion on this episode when it was announced, and when you declared earlier that it was worse than Philly Vanilli. However, while you clearly had a strong point on that episode, giving an opinion I had no problem with, your argument for why Slice of Life was worse was not so strong. Before I continue, I will let everyone know that I have no hatred or resentment toward the guy. I'm also not going to shower Slice of Life with praise because they finally gave recognition to the background characters, because I was never into the whole background character thing to begin with. But I'm not innocent of the whole idea either. He just needs to realize that Slice of Life actually works as a My Little Pony episode for any fan of the show because of how the episode was structured and executed. There is nothing within the show that provides any insight on these characters and now the audience is expected to care about all of them in one go. One of Jerry's first complaints was that because they are background characters who only diehard fans pay attention to, the episode premise is not going to appeal to casual fans. That would be the case if the episode was just throwing fan service at the viewer's face with no explanation. Don't get me wrong, this episode was littered with fan service, but it was integrated into the story properly. The episode actually starts disproving his main argument. If DHX had used these characters from the start in the same way the Simpsons and Family Guy do, then this would have been different. In fact, DHX already does this with characters like the Princesses, the Spa Twins, and Bulk Biceps. An episode about Celestia with Twilight acting in a supporting role to her? Excellent idea. This, on the other hand, did not have that kind of setup. Well, we start with Cranky and Matilda, who were introduced very properly in their own episode in Season 2. And even the very beginning introduces their life and how they love each other very well to any viewer who hasn't even seen Friend Indeed. It also introduces a conflict that the audience, as he says in his own words, can be invested in, which is a misplanned wedding. And we've already seen how the show's first one went, so this should be interesting. And from that concept, the episode allows for the viewer to follow the lives of other ponies. We're not getting these random shots of, Hey Doc, what are you doing today? Oh, I'm dealing with science and all things timey-wimey, but now I'm taking a break to go bowling. Oh, I see. Well, I'm gonna go buy some flowers because I messed up on another order again. No, there is a consistent reason why we are brought to each scene. Why is this guy talking about science? Oh, it's because Muffin's here. Yes, I'm calling her Muffins. The episode does, and there will be no buts about it. Messed up their wedding invitations and wishes she could go back in time to fix it. We're not focusing on these characters because only the bronies want to. We focus on them because they are now integrated into the main plot. This is used perfectly throughout the whole episode. The episode introduces each character with a tie-in to the main plot. Why Octavia? Oh, she's playing for the wedding. Why Lyra and Bonbon? Bon? Oh, they're setting up for the wedding. Why Stephen Magnet? Oh, he's talking to the bride and introducing himself to her and the audience. Barely is a character just forced into an episode for no reason, other than a few of those cameos during this scene, but again, it's all while going to the wedding. And while some characters are frequently glimpsed doing things in the background of a scene, most people don't notice it. Why? There's a story that currently has your attention. Jerry also talks about this episode as if we were jumping from character to character, just trying to introduce them briefly, give some fan service, and then moving on. And if it was done that way, it definitely would have confused casual viewers and made the episode unenjoyable. This is not the case, as the characters are introduced with a tie into the main plot, and then given the freedom to do whatever they want, because now we get a glimpse of their slice of life. We were properly introduced to why we're focusing on them. And that's how we get Slice of Life, supplanting Philly Vanilli as the worst episode of the series. Now Jerry also stated that this episode was worse than Philly Vanilli. How? He stated that Philly Vanilli is bad because it taught a tainted lesson with its character. You cannot teach a lesson to a character that he says is not mentally able to learn it and is subject to the writer's whim. So what's wrong with the lesson in this episode of not forsaking the background, learned by background characters, whom, if I may add, may not have been able to participate in Do Princess Dream of Magic Sheep if they were forsaken? Touching more on this lesson, I actually feel there's a better lesson that this episode teaches that is not touched upon and works perfect in the Friendship is Magic series. Question. How did Twilight learn to make friends? She was brought together with them to perform a task and throughout that journey was able to gain insight to their character and personality. This is exactly what Slice of Life does and the episode portrays the reason why we make friends. Think of your best friend. At one point in your life, they were not your friend and they lived in the background. However, all it took was to be introduced to them, find a common interest, and gain insight to their personality for you to determine, yeah, I like this person. The episode allows viewers to experience this with new characters of the show, 
We've already been through four seasons with our main characters, so it doesn't hurt to see if maybe you find interest in the other characters of Ponyville. All the characters in Slice of Life may not have been interesting to every viewer, but they were still given a part of the main story, which is what the mayor alludes to at the end. It was still bad regardless. Slice of Life gleefully sucks off the Brony community. Jerry, you can't say an episode is the worst just because the entire thing has fan service for the Brony community. Would this episode have happened without the community? Possibly, but it would have become more like amending fences, with the main heroines having a slightly bigger role. Like I said, the fan service was never overly used that it distracted from the main plot. No character's story was followed for too long, and every character had their own conflicts resolved along with resolving the conflict of the wedding. Also, bringing up that this episode is bad because it caters to the fandom negates pretty much your whole argument. Because as you explained, most viewers would not even know that this episode was sucking off the brony fandom. Therefore, these stories we see do not look like fanfare. And because they were introduced relating to the main plot, for most viewers, there was never the feeling of just being thrown into their lives at random just to throw fanfare at the screen. In the end, if you felt this episode was mediocre or not the best, I would understand it's not for everyone. And also, I don't think it's the best either. But saying this episode is the worst? You need a lot more evidence that would relate and be understandable to most members of the viewing audience like you did with Philly Vanilli to back up that claim. Because this video did not do it for me in the slightest. Well, I'm Lopone View, and I'm ripping off the ending of the guy I'm critiquing.